Um, all right, well, let's jump into this tonight. I'm not, I promise I'm not going to go to, uh, for an hour or anything like that. Um, but I do just want to encourage us tonight. I know that, you know, we've, uh, hopefully you've been encouraged. I hope that you have. Um, I hope that just hearing simply what God is doing in the hearts of our young people encourages you. Um, and if it doesn't, man, you've you got to check your heart a little bit. Um, and so um, it's exciting to see what God's doing. And I, I'm thankful for these three ladies here that were uh, um, faithful and surrendered their week um, to go and, uh, and to be with those young ladies. Um, I wasn't going to go because I was like, well, I'm not just going to go hang out with a bunch of girls. <laughs> so um, you guys have fun. And, um, and I know that they did. And I know it's, it's a tiring thing if you've never done it before. Um, but it is always a blessing to see how God moves and how God works on our young people. And so I am thankful for those three ladies and their faithfulness to, to the Lord um, above all. And so, um, you know, they were talking about peace and what it is to have peace and how we can have peace. And, um, you know, is peace an achievable thing? And, and um, as they were talking about the world's definition of peace, many of them mentioned it, right? What did they say? Freedom from disturbance. And so if you would look at the, the, um, the de definition of peace based on what the world says, um, it seems impossible, does it not? Um, it seems like an unachievable thing to have freedom from disturbance or tranquility. Uh, also another definition, a state of pe or period in which there is no war or a war has ended. Is it not every day that we're hearing about rumors of war, right? Uh, it, it seems impossible to achieve peace. But as they learned this week, and hopefully they can live from this day on, um, peace is achievable, but only through our Savior Jesus Christ. And so... Um, you know, what is biblical peace then? Well, in Colossians 3.15, you don't have to turn there, but this is what it says. It says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Paul says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. So what does it mean to have peace? Well, peace is to fully trust in God's promises, and it's to relinquish control from ourselves and give it to Him. Read that verse that they quoted, Be still and know that I am God. Right? It's understanding who our God is and what he can do. And, and so this world does lack true peace, but we as Christians can have real peace. But I'm here to tell you, church, that Satan is here to take away your peace. And it's a battle that we as Christians face every single day to hold on to that peace. Because Satan wants to take it from you. And, and let, let's be honest, he does a really good job at it. He's been doing it for a long time, and he knows what he's doing. And so he's really mastered his techniques. And so we live in a world that is, is hard to just stop and slow down, right? Uh, so physically, sometimes you can sit down and relax, but mentally, right, your, your brain's always running, and it's always racing. Um, it's, you know, I always hear, this, you hear the joke where, like, a, a wife will ask her husband, what are you thinking about? Nothing. And, and, uh, and apparently, sometimes you can just think about nothing, um, I'm still working on that, all right? So I'm still trying, so pray for me. Um, I just sometimes want to think about nothing. Um, but we as Christians, we are truly facing a battle. And so today, real quick, I just have three things quickly I just want to share with you um, for the next few minutes. And so if you would turn your Bibles real quick to Ephesians chapter 6 with me tonight, I want to, I want to challenge us with three things about this battle that we as Christians are facing. Now, this is a, a well-known passage here, right? The armor of God. You grew up hearing this and the different pieces of God's armor. And so uh, the first thing I want to talk to you tonight is simply we have to understand the battle that we're in. Right? We have to understand what kind of battle it is. If you're going to be prepared for a battle, right, you have to know, okay, what, what's the tactics? What's the plan? Who are we fighting? What, what, are we, what do we need for this battle? Well, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Church, what does that tell us? That this battle we are facing is not a physical battle. Rather, it is a spiritual battle. It is a spiritual battle. He says, listen, we have to be strong in the Lord, but we have to put on the right armor. And that's the armor of the Lord, because if we're going to stand against the, the attacks of the devil, then we have to have God's armor. And then in verse 12, he says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? This isn't physical, but against principalities, powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this world. See, we, we look around and we see the madness in our world, but we have to know as Christians that there's more to it than simply what meets the eye, right? We see what's going on, but we have to know that there's something behind it pushing the evil and wickedness in our world. 
and that's Satan, right? He's doing everything he can to deceive and manipulate this world. And we are so connected in this world, he's doing a really good job. And so this is not a spiritual battle. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Paul says, though we may live a physical life with this skin and flesh, we may be walking in the flesh. We do not war after the flesh. It turns into a fleshly battle, right? It turns into a battle where the flesh is eating you away, but it's, it's, a, it's a battle of the mind and of the heart, and Satan wants to win over the minds of Christians by filling our minds with, with fear, right, with evil things, with negative thoughts. That's what Satan does, and it causes us to make up these ideas of things that aren't real. And so we have to understand this battle isn't physical, but it's spiritual. And so the weapons we're going to need to fight the battle are not physical, but rather what? Spiritual. What does he say? If you, if you did turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but what are they? But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What does that tell us? Our weapons that we are going to need to fight the battle to maintain the peace of Jesus Christ can only come from God himself that we cannot do it on our own. We need him. Amen. And so my second thing here tonight is that we must be equipped for the battle. So we have to be equipped with the right things. And Paul continues that in Ephesians chapter 6. If you would turn back there with me, and he says in verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Man, what a battle plan that we have laid out for us in Ephesians chapter 6. We get the, the keys to fighting and winning the battle. He says, listen, if you're going to win the battle, you need the right weapons. And so you're going to need some things. He says you're going to need uh, truth, right? You're going to need your belt of truth. You're going to need your breastplate of righteousness. And then uh, skipping verse 15, we're going to go back to that. In verse 16, he says, And taking the shield of faith, we need faith to win the battle. He says, Taking the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is what? It's the Word of God. But in verse 15, is kind of where I want to uh, land tonight real quick. And he says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You see, as we read through these things, we understand real quick, we need all of this, right? Like we don't pick and choose what we're going to put on for the day. We need every single piece of the armor. Because if you're missing the helmet, then your head's vulnerable. right? If you're missing the breastplate, then your heart's vulnerable. And so we need the whole thing to truly be able to fight the battle. And so, but in verse 15, right, we all understand how important the right shoes are, right? Before the girls went to camp, we encouraged them, you need to take tennis shoes, because you're going to be walking and climbing and doing all these things. And so you need the right shoes. And you know how it feels when you pick the wrong shoes for the day. And by the end of the day, you're ready, right, to get rid of those shoes, to burn them. Because your feet hurt, right? And so we know the importance of the right shoe, right? You go to the shoe store. You try on a pair of shoes. What do you do? You run around in them, right? You make sure that they fit right and they're good. Because putting on shoes is important. You need the right pair of shoes. Well, in battle, they needed the right shoe wear. They needed the right footwear. They needed a, a shoe that was going to help them stand firm in the battle, right? And something that they could wear, right, throughout the day. Now, I'm sure that they weren't wearing Skechers um, and, and New Balances, okay, in this moment. They probably were a little more uncomfortable than what, what we wear today. But Paul says, hey, Christians, you need to have your feet shod with what? the preparation of the gospel of peace. So what does that mean? That means as Christians, we need to wake up in the morning prepared for the day by putting on the gospel. You say, what is that? Well, what does that mean? I mean, I'm saved. I'm saved. But what happens is we go out in our day and we forget who Jesus is, right? Because the day starts happening, right? Life happens, um, struggles come, trials happen, temptations come, and we completely get blindsided. We forget who Christ is. We forget who he is to us. We forget the hope that we have in him. And the enemy does really well to get us off track, to trip us up because we didn't put on the right shoe wear. Right? We, we get tripped up by the, the, the troubles of this world. 
when Paul says, listen, you need to put on the peace that comes from Jesus Christ. And what is that peace? It's knowing that Jesus came, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, and that he overcame death and hell so that we may have hope and salvation. That is the peace that we can put on every single day. Because when you know that, there is nothing in this world that can stop you. There is nothing the enemy can throw at you that can stop you. When you know that this time is, is mere uh, moments in comparison to eternity, that, that this 70, 80, 90 years is nothing compared to a 1,000, 100,000, a million years with Jesus. And so we can look at this life and we can say, I don't care what the enemy throws at me. I got peace because I know I know who my Savior is, and I know what he told me. And he said, hey, one day you're going to live with me for eternity. Can you imagine that thief on the cross? Can you imagine the, the, the pain that he was enduring? And then Jesus said, but today you'll be with me in paradise. Can you imagine the peace that must have overwhelmed him, knowing, wow, whoa, I, I, I'm actually going to be living in eternity in paradise. And he, I'm, I guarantee he didn't understand the implications of that in that moment right? completely. But what a change that must have made. Christians, we have that, but the world doesn't. The world doesn't. Paul says in what? 2 Corinthians 4, 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. The world's blinded, but he says, Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The world is blinded. They're living in darkness. And the only thing that can give them light is the gospel of Christ. And so Christians, we need to take them that gospel. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Don't you like good news? It, it, don't you like when someone comes to you and say, I got good news, and you're like, yes. You don't like when someone comes to you and says, hey, we need to talk. You're like, oh, no. But when someone says, I got good news, that's what we need to go out and tell the world, I have good news. See, when you, when you have that excitement and that joy and say, I have good news. Now, the world oftentimes hears that good news and thinks, but what? I have to give up all of these things, though? I have to give up this life? But I have good news. None of those things are worth it when you know Jesus. None of those things compared to knowing him. And so listen, it's good news, but we got to take it. You know what I learned uh, studying for this message? You know, we, you know, we think about Jesus calming the storm. You guys remember the story when Jesus was doing what on the boat while his disciples were panicking? He was asleep, right? And so Jesus is, is asleep and his disciples are panicking. and They're on a boat with Jesus, but they're panicking, right? And they're thinking, Lord, help us. We're going to die. And, and so Christ goes up and he's like, what is wrong with you guys? Oh, you have little faith. Where's your faith? But Jesus, what was he doing? He was sleeping. So what does that tell us about the storms of life? That you can sleep through them, right? No, truly though, but we can have peace even in the midst of a storm, right? The ladies learned that. It rained every day, but they still had a good week. But when we look at this and we say, okay, when I know Jesus, I can have peace in the midst of what may look like the, the most uh, destructive storm surrounding us in this world when I know him. And that's the peace that God wants every single person to have. And the last thing here, if we're fully equipped, if we put on the shoes of the gospel of peace, if we're walking in the peace that comes from knowing Jesus every single day, then church, we can have triumph over the battle. And in verse 18 through 20 in Ephesians 6, Paul says this, "...praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit." And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel. Amen. For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that I therein may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul says, listen, if I am fully equipped, if I put on the armor, I'm, I'm going out in prayer. I can then do what God has called me to do. I can walk out in boldness and I can boldly speak what God's called me to do. And church, we can have that same triumph. We can walk out these doors and be bold in our faith because we know Jesus and we have his peace. You know what, you know what the Bible tells us about the principalities and powers of this world? The Bible tells us that God 
has already overcome them. See, we get caught up in letting those things, in letting Satan hold us back and hold us down. The Bible says that God already triumphed over it. In Colossians chapter 2, it says in verse 13, "...and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses." That's that salvation. "...blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross." Pay attention to verse 15. "...and having spoiled principalities and powers." He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. See, Jesus on the cross triumphed over that, uh, that wicked government that hung him on the cross. He, he died on that cross, and he triumphed over death and hell. He took the key back, right? He, he's like, you are no longer. See, Jesus has been above uh, and higher than all things for eternity. But, but he just showed us, hey, uh, Satan, you can do whatever you want for a time, but you're not in control. You're not in charge. I'm still in charge. And he says, we can have triumph over the enemy if we simply know Jesus, if we know the love that Christ has for us. The last thing here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we read this earlier, but I want to read verse 5. See, verse 5 tells us something. He says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Christians, the world wants you to live in confusion. The world wants you to live in a way where we can't really figure out what is truth, but Christians, we operate in nothing but the truth. We as Christians are, are called to operate in the truth because we have the truth. It's the word of God. And so when you have thoughts that are, are, are ridiculous because, well, you made them up. Yeah, I, I'm sure we've all done it, right? You, you're like, you, something pops into your mind, and then you've created an entire scenario that never was going to happen, but your mind just created it. And you've caused yourself to worry about something that was never real in the first place. Our mind is so powerful, but God wants you to use that to bring him glory and to use it for him. And Satan says, no, but I want to use that to control you. But, but church, we can have triumph. He says, cast down all of those things. If there's something that pops up in your mind and it's false, it's lies, it's deceptive, we can cast that away and know that God's truth, God's truth triumphs over all other truths. In the end, his truth is what will triumph. And we can bring into captivity all of those thoughts because we truly can control our mind. It seems impossible sometimes. But in our weakness, right, God is stronger, and his strength is seen. And so God wants us to have the victory. And he want, but really, church, what he wants you to know is you already have the victory. Like You can already live in victory. You just have to realize it, that God's triumphed. He's done it already. We just have to take hold of him and say, all right, I can live in the peace that only comes from God. By walking in him every single day, by putting on Jesus Christ every single day. In Philippians 4, their verse, it talked about this peace that passeth all understanding. That's a peace that when the world looks at you, they think, how in the world? How in the world are they so calm and so peaceful in this world, in this life, in, in that struggle, in that struggle, in that loss, in, in whatever they're going through? See, that's a peace that we can't even understand, but God says that's achievable. And then, he, and then he, the very next verse, in verse 8, what does he say? Now think on these things. Think on things that are true and just and holy and pure. It all goes back to what, what's up going on up here. Church, you can have the victory. You can maintain peace because you know Jesus. So would you bow your heads with me tonight?